Well, welcome to K2, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, looking forward to spend the next few minutes with you guys. And um, if you don't know me, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the teachers. I get a chance to oversee the arts. I did want to, I, I wanted to extend, you know, bless someone as well. Uh, ben, I think you're a great drummer, but I'm going to tell you, Wes has never sounded as good as he sounded tonight. <laughs> so I just, I don't mean to offend you, but Wes just killed it tonight, so... <laughs> anyway, welcome to K2. Glad you're here. Hey, listen, last week we kicked off uh, a new series called The Good Life, and uh, we're looking, going through the book of First John and kind of understanding how the author of that, well, that's a letter, actually, how the author of First John, how he would describe the good life. Last week, Dave talked with us about understanding that good life happens in connection with God and with each other. We have to have those two components, and that's kind of essential to having the good life. And we're not really wired to be lone rangers and live, you know, as loners. And today, I want to take the next logical step in understanding. We're going to just continue reading through this. But in understanding that if we're created to be in community and fellowship is the Christian word, which means connection, community, you know, partnership, friendship. If we're created in such a way, how then do we go about accomplishing that task? And um, we're calling this message, The Good Life Happens in the Light, because good things happen in the light and bad things happen in the dark, right? Not so much. I went on this crazy rabbit trail thinking I was going to blow you all away with statistics of how crime is so much more expressed at night. It's not. More in the day. So I threw that away. <laughs> My, yeah, I was like, crow, man, come on. Anyway, but I do want to talk about light, and it's kind of interesting because we all understand that light provides great value to our lives, right? Without light, it would be very difficult, if not at all impossible, to live without light. It'd be, it'd be very, very challenging. And if you're, from, if you're from Utah, you may take this for granted, but I'm from Michigan, so I don't. In case you didn't know this, Utah is the seventh sunniest state in the Union. Michigan is the tenth cloudiest state in the union. <laughs> okay, Utah averages almost 5,000 hours of sunlight a year. Michi Michigan, about 4,000. It's a difference. Utah has about 13 and a half hours. Michigan has two and a half to three hours less sunlight per day. That's significant. <laughs> and one of the things you see, you, you've probably heard of seasonal affective disorder. Have you heard of that? Right, and seasonal affective disorder, if you don't know, is just when the sun in the winter and the fall produces less sunlight for us to experience, we have a decreased uh, serotonin or melatonin serotonin production, and that can actually cause depression. You know how you fix it? Sunlight. <laughs> so it's important, but it's not just like, you know, not only the, the, you know, the visual properties of light that are important. They, They've started now using uh, UV light to do sterilization and cleaning. Did you know that? They clean buildings and offices and stuff using light. UVC that can actually, um, I just read this this week, that UVC radiation can break down the DNA of bacteria, viruses, and mold to make them completely harmless. And it can actually purify water and air. So there's like all these great things can happen. Then you think about just about plants, right? What would happen if we didn't have sunlight and plants. We wouldn't have oxygen because the photosynthesis process takes carbon dioxide in and spits out oxygen for us to live on. So light is a pretty important thing, but let me go even a step further to simplify something that we all sort of understand. Ultimately, probably, the most obvious benefit of light is that it exposes what's in the dark. Right? It's not like I shine a light in the corner or something new appears. I'm just now aware of that. That's why we take you know, we take our lanterns or flashlights when we go camping because we want to see what's in the dark. Now, I thought it'd be really helpful for us to understand that light is also an essential part of our relational experience. We ha living in the light with each other and living in the light with God is important. So I thought it'd be really helpful. What I'm going to do today in the message, we're turning off all the lights and I'm going to give the rest of the message in the dark. What do you think? It was a terrible idea. It's a horrible idea. I'm not going to do that. 
because we would have less connection. You wouldn't see me, I wouldn't see you, and, and our, our relationship would be diminished as a result of less light. Now, what I want to do is we're going to pick up continuing in 1 John, where, where Dave left off last week, and we're going to continue reading through this to understand how this all works. And uh, just, just as a little bit of background, what we know is that John is writing to these Christians that he has a long-standing relationship with. And he's sort of this fatherly spiritual figure in their life. He uses these endearing terms like dear children or dear friends. He's got great relationship with them, great rapport, and he's kind of like this mentor to them. And uh, they, he, he's probably, most people believe he's writing to the, uh, the book of Revelation, John also wrote. And if you remember at the beginning of that book, he talks about seven churches, you remember the hot and cold church and stuff like that? He's talking, he's talking probably to those churches that he had oversight with, those, those churches, this group of churches. And uh, they, they seem to be mature in their faith. Like they've been at, he, he says stuff like, hey, I'm not telling you new stuff you haven't already learned. I'm not, I'm not, this is nothing new. You've already heard this. So they've been at this for a while. However, in the midst of their faith journey and being mature Christians, they are being threatened with a couple things. The lure of worldliness. Don't raise your hand. Anyone here struggle with that every single day? But they're also being threatened by a couple heretical teachings that were trying to creep into the church. And specifically, there, was, there were two. One was Gnosticism. David talked about this a little bit last week. And Gnosticism, again, if you weren't here, Gnosticism says that matter is inherently evil. Therefore, what you do to the body doesn't matter because it's already evil. So now I can do whatever I want with my body. It also says that since matter is inherently evil, a divine being could not inhabit human flesh because if it did, it would make it not divine, unholy, correct. So he's got this going on. But then there's this other sect of Gnosticism called Docetism. And Docetism comes from the word dokia, which means to seem. And what it's saying is, that this, this heretical teaching says that Jesus Christ only seemed to take on human flesh. He didn't really take on human flesh. And since he didn't really take on human flesh, he didn't really suffer and die on the cross. He just seemed to suffer and die. And so if he didn't suffer and die, do I have to suffer and die? No. And this produces this elite group of people who think they live above the norms of right and wrong, living pretty deplorable lives. And in, in, in both of these circumstances, it's a flat denial of the incarnation of Christ, which if you remember John we're talking about here, wrote the Gospel of John. And this is like, this is the baseline of where John begins when he's teaching. Look at, just look at this with me, if you would, in uh, John Chapter one, verse one, not first John, the gospel of John. And he says this, in the beginning, the word existed, capital W word, meaning Jesus, existed and the word was with God and the word, what? Was God. So Jesus was God. And then he goes down to verse 14 and it says, what? The word became, yeah, the word seemed to become flesh. No, it doesn't say that. And John's saying, this is a line in the sand. This is super important. You need to understand who Jesus was. And he came and made his dwelling among us. Jesus incarnated to be sure, and he did it on our behalf because he had a mission in mind. He was going to suffer and die on our behalf so that we could be back in right relationship with him. So What I want to do is I want to pick up in, with one, one, more, one more little like back story that I want to share with you or, or just information that's kind of helpful. He, we're going to read here, but you're going to see that John's going to use these like comparisons. He's going to use light and dark, and he's going to use justice and forgiveness. And then he's going to drive a stake into the ground around this concept of sin and confession and how essential those things are to living in right community with God and each other. Okay, now what I want to do, let's just jump in. I'm going to read this whole passage in 1 John. And if you're following along, it's chapter 1, verse 5 through chapter 2, verse 2. Here we go. 
This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not with us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you, so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Wow, there's a lot going on in there, a lot. And so what does he do? The same thing he does in John, he establishes the baseline of who Jesus is. Here in 1 John, he's establishing the baseline of who God is. And let's look at what he says, verse five of chapter one. This is the message we've heard from Jesus and now declare to you, John saying, remember, I was one of the disciples. I heard this, as they say, straight from the horse's mouth. This is straight from Jesus. And what is it? God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. God is light, no dark. Now, what's interesting is he uses these two interchangeable concepts around light. The first part, it comes from the Greek understanding. It's the sphere dominated by righteousness, goodness, and the knowledge of God. That's, so like everything good, holy, righteous, pure, that kind of stuff, that's what he's referring to as light. But he's also referring to as the great light that exposes the things we hide in the dark. He uses these two terms interchangeably, and he does the same thing with darkness. The darkness is the sphere dominated by evil, sinfulness, and ignorance of God, or the lack of God, and, and his ways, and it's represented by the absence of light. And darkness is also the place where what? We hide the junk that we don't want people to see. And he's trying to help us understand the difficulty with having darkness and light cohabitating the same space. So that's what he says about God. And you think about this. You've, you've heard the term, that dude is shady, right? That dude is shady. What, what does that mean? Yeah, he can't be trusted. Why can't he be trusted? Because the light isn't hitting it. <laughs> That's what creates shade, right? The light shines, it hits something in the way, and it blocks the light. Now that dude is shady. The same is true in a spiritual sense for us. So that's who God is. But then he goes straight to the heart and says, so if this is God, let's talk about who man is. And he gives us two options. One's not so great. One is pretty good. <laughs> the first is option A. We'll start with the bad news. Option A is we are liars or cellar dwellers. We like to live in the dark. Verse six, so we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. If we say we have fellowship with God, but we're not living like the light, we're lying. And he kind of breaks it down in an interesting way. He, he doesn't just leave it as we're lying. He spells it out. We're lying three different ways. Three different ways we're lying. The first is this. He says we're lying to others. And you know, to be honest, we, we do this. We all do this. Every single person in here does this. We understand. Why do we lie to others? Well, we lie to others because we're trying to protect a persona or an image that you have of me, even if it's not true. And if I show you the junk and shine a light into the corner where all my junk lives, you're not gonna think the same thing about me, right? We all have, I, listen, I don't know all of you in here. A lot of you don't know me. But here's what I do know about you and you know about me. There's junk in your life. There's stuff you're trying to hide from others. You don't want your wife to know about this. You don't want your husband to know about this, your boss, your employees your kids, because as soon as they know, they have a different perception of who you are. So we lie to other people. But maybe even, and, and by the way, so if I'm lying to people, am I actually in right relationship with you 
if you only know my false self? No. We don't have a relationship if you don't know who I am. But let's get a little even, it gets even, even maybe more insidious because not only are we lying to others, look at verse eight, he says, if we claim to have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living the truth. Not, we're lying. But who are we lying to now? Ourselves. Now, this one's a little more tricky to understand. And I, you know, think about this. Why do we lie to ourselves? Well, I think the reason we lie to ourselves is because we don't call it a lie. We call it a reason right? Well, see, the reason I did that was, oh. And what happens with the reason is a reason becomes an excuse. This allows me to continue to do the thing I'm doing without having to change. And an excuse becomes permission. If I can understand and make myself believe that there's a reason I'm doing this and I can justify it in my own mind, then I just keep doing it and I don't have to change. But here's the point. As long as I continue lying to myself about what the truth is with God, I'm not in right relationship with God because I'm believing false stuff about God. Then he goes on in verse 10. He says, we claim we have not sinned. We're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. We lie to others. We lie to ourselves. And then we call God a liar. And then we think we can be in relationship with him. And here's what's interesting. You see, if I say I can live however, like the, you know, Gnostics and the Docetists in this time, and do whatever, and God says I can't, what have we established? We don't agree. What else have we established? We have a different method about how to be in relationship with each other, meaning we don't have relationship that's healthy. If God is the complete absence of darkness, the completion of light, complete goodness, holiness, and we're living in darkness with deplorable behavior, making excuses and lying and hiding stuff, we're not in good relationship with God. And actually, we're not in good relationship with others either. That's option A. Who's in? Well, here's the problem. We all are, unfortunately. We don't mean to be, but we are. But here's option B, and this is where the hope kicks in. We can be liars, or we can be truth tellers or light dwellers that live in the light. Look at verse seven. It says, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. This one, all sin or darkness, gets rid of the darkness in our life if we have fellowship with him. Now, What's interesting about this is that he indicates that living in the light with God puts us in right relationship with who? Who? Say it. Other. Wait, wait, wouldn't it make more sense to say, if I'm doing what God says, now I'm in right relationship with him? That's not what he says. He says it puts you in right relationship with others. And so the question we have to kind of wrestle the ground is, so Why does right relationship with God precede my ability to be in right relationship with you? And I think that the answer lies in our ability to understand sin. Oh, I said it, four-letter word. It was a joke. (laughs) And how sin operates in our lives. I need to understand what sin is and how it operates in our lives. So... The word sin is hamartano, which just means to do the wrong thing or miss the mark, okay? And we like to think of ourselves as an individualized culture. But this is a term that they use in archery. They would, you know, you missed the mark, you sinned. We like to think of ourselves as a collection of individuals, right? My sin, my issue. Not my problem, not a problem. We like to think that I... If I do something, it affects me and only me. But the problem is, when you're in community, it actually doesn't work that way. I thought, I I just came up with the best illustration ever. Susie got this for, she's my wife, if you don't know. She got this for, we always buy games at Christmas time. And she bought this. 
And, uh, you know, it's an axe throwing thing. Don't worry. It's fake. No, no one will be harmed in this illustration yet. And uh, so the way this works is, you know, it's great if I throw this and I hit the mark and it sticks. That's fantastic. And then when I miss, no big deal. But then I began thinking about this. And I thought, hey, Bryce, will you do me a favor? Will you come here? Will you stick this right, right in there somewhere? <laughs> just, just right in this pews there. No, 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 five rows back. Go five rows back. That's perfect. No. Thank you. Now, what I want to do, can you turn the lights off? Because I want to live in darkness. Okay. Here's the problem. Yeah, you can bring that back up. I'm not going to shoot an arrow. <laughs> Here's the, I'm not going to shoot an arrow yet either. Here's the problem. If I'm living in darkness before God, and I'm living in darkness with you, and I shoot at that thing, and I miss it, it's going to hit something. And I'll tell you who's going to know the person that gets hit and all the other people around them. And we think, though, we can miss the mark with no effect on our relationship with those around us. God says it doesn't work that way. And if I do, if I was shooting at this, by the way, you got targets, you're probably shooting back. But here's the thing. If I'm shooting at the target and we're living in the light, it would probably go more like, hey, move out of the way. <laughs> Give me lots of space. I haven't shot that in a few years. Right? And you'd move away. We could still, right? Because we're living in the light and we know each other. But this passage, verse 7, says it so beautifully. It says, if we're living in the light of God's presence. What happens when the presence of light comes around you, darkness? It exposes whatever. We said this at the beginning. It shows us what's living in the darkness. It doesn't create new stuff. It just shows us what's already there. And so, when my dark stuff gets exposed, you now know the real me. And now we're in relationship. And it's a healthy good relationship. And so the question we have to answer as we close out today is this. So how do I live in such a way that I can become a truth teller or a light dweller and be in relationship with God and with you? And he goes on in chapter two, verse two, he says this. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin but if anyone does sin, you have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the same one that he went to great lengths to make sure you understand exactly who he is and the incarnated God in, on earth. Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. John is saying, this, and this is what God's saying to you guys. I'm telling you this so that you won't sin. But here's the thing, you're gonna. The reality is you're probably gonna. And the good news is God has made a way once you miss the mark to clean up the messes you've made, expose the dark areas and bring you back into light and into right relationship with him and with each other. And he does all the work for us. But how do we do that? It's a real simple process. We confess, we confess. Most famous verse in the New Testament about confession is this, 1 John 1, 9, you all know it. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. And I just want to throw this out, out there. I, I said this and we were talking and then talked through. I just want to share this with you. It said, this, is, this was a profound thing I heard. I didn't come up with this. This is something that really profoundly affected me. 
If we confess, he forgives. When does he forgive? Right then. But you don't feel forgiven. Well, that might be because you're lying to yourself. Don't put that on God. But, but, but my friends don't forgive me. Maybe that's because you're lying to them. Don't put that on God. Maybe you need to confess to your friends too. There's no guarantee they're gonna forgive you, but God guarantees he will. So don't wait around for you to feel forgiven. You're forgiven the second you ask. I wanna share this quick story, and I'm running a few minutes long, but I'm gonna share this story anyways. It's a story you all know, the story of David and Bathsheba, right? Just as a quick review, oh yeah, and we're gonna pass out communion. Yeah, thank you, I'm so glad you got up (laughs) because it's about to be an awkward moment there, unlike this one right now. Uh, Let me tell you the story of David and Bathsheba. It it goes like this, right? David's not where he's supposed to be. It's wartime and he's not at war. And he looks out and he sees beautiful Bathsheba and he decides, I want to have her. He brings her in and he has an adulterous relationship with her. Well, the bad news gets worse. She's pregnant and she's married. So David devises this scheme and this plan to keep his PR up. He wants to look like he's doing the right thing. So he begins the process of living out of fellowship with God to live in fellowship with darkness. And he creates a series of lies and a series of actions to eventually have Bathsheba's wife murdered. What's that? Right. (laughs) Husband murdered. Now, David, I think, probably believed he was getting away with this, but the problem is the palace has ears and people in the palace all knew. And so what happens? Eventually, David's key advisor, Nathan, can't take it any longer. And he comes to him, he tells him this really, really interesting story. He says, David, I want to tell you about something. There's this guy, he's a really rich guy, and he's got just multitudes of sheep. And there's this really poor family And when you get these, just hold on to them. It's really poor family, and they have one little tiny sheep. And they raised this sheep as a pet. It says they carried it in their arms. So it was time for a big feast. And so the rich guy, what does he do? He goes to the family with one little sheep, and he takes the sheep, and he butchers the sheep, and he feeds that sheep to his people at the feast. And when David hears this, he is infuriated. He's like, the injustice is unacceptable. Who is this man? And Nathan looks at him and he says, you in your dealings with Bathsheba. And David is wrecked. Rightfully so, but he is wrecked. Now you probably know that story, but you may not know this, that David wrote a Psalm, Psalm 51, that we're gonna use as a guidepost for confession today. And it's a psalm that he wrote specifically addressing his sin with Bathsheba. And here it is. I'm just going to read a couple verses. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Who has he sinned against? God. And it affected this. He no longer had the right relationship with God or others. And he realizes he's got to get this thing straightened out. So, band, you guys can come forward. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to move into a time of communion, and we're going to worship as well. And uh, I would just want you to hold on to your bread and your, 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 your juice there. I'm going to let you take this whenever you feel ready, because first what I want to do is I want to guide us through a time of personal confession. You're just going to do this in your head. You're not going to say it out loud for the people around you to hear. Maybe you need to do that later with some people. But right now, just to confess before God. And just to, I want to walk us through four simple practices, four simple steps 
for the practice of confession. And they go like this. The first is I admit, then I weep, then I ask, then I believe. Admit, weep, ask, believe. Now, this is how this looks. The first thing in confession I need to do, and I want you guys to close your eyes, just envision, is there something in your life, an area, a belief, an action, a relationship, a thought, a back door you're leaving open for the future that you know is in the darkness before God? If there is, confess that to God and tell him, The second thing you do is you weep. And this is just to have godly sorrow before God. You just tell him how much you know this must be breaking his heart or express from your very soul how saddened you are with the darkness that you're living in that's preventing you from having a relationship with, your, with him or with others. And then you just ask for him to forgive you. It's really simple. Jesus, forgive me. I've done wrong. This is what I did. Please forgive. And then believe. He says, you are forgiven. You are restored in relationship with me. I just want to pray. I'm going to read this passage. Jesus, we're not individual. We we are community. My sin affects you. It affects my family. It affects us. It affects friends. Forgive me for believing that I can live in the dark and have communion with light. I pray that you would offer forgiveness to me and that I would feel it and live in the reality that I am a forgiven individual, restored to right relationship. Thank you for your grace. And you're telling me this so that I won't sin, but when I do, you say you'll forgive me. Thank you so much. And then when you're done praying, we're, we're gonna move in and worship. You feel free to sit in the seats or you can stand and worship or whatever. Take your communion as you feel led by God. But I just wanna read this passage. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till I come. Jesus, we admit, we weep before you. We ask you to forgive us and we believe you will do it. We pray all of this in your name, amen.